Well, good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. We are so delighted that you are here. We are here because we want to see God lifted high. We want to behold our King and worship Him through singing, through praying, through the reading of God's Word, and through the giving of our offerings. So as you're here, if you're a guest this morning, we'd love to get to know you better. If you can, please fill out the card in front of you in the pew, and you can place that in the offering plate when the time comes. We'd love to uh, greet you warmly in the name of our Lord and to get to know you better. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, you are our God, and we want to see you lifted high. We want to worship you. We want to adore you and treasure you. God, we ask that you would speak to us as the word is preached this morning, that you would warm our hearts in obedience and faith, and that we would love you more and love others more because of our time together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean. This is what we call our multi-gen, multi-generational service, and it is not that every service uh, is, is not a multi-gen. Every service is uh, multiple generations worshiping. This is one of the services where we make it obvious that we are a church of all generations, and we want that to be clear in corporate worship. So this is why we have these uh, various choirs and uh, different ages on the platform. We want to call to worship from Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. We worship this morning because he is preeminent and because he has reconciled us to God by the blood of his cross. Let's stand and worship a holy God who brings us near by the blood of Jesus. Who else commands all the host of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and
Voices, everyone join, orchestra, choir, everybody sing the first, fourth verse, our voices together.
Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. To God be the glory. We're going to ask that you would join me for the reading of God's Word. Scripture will come from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 10. Please join with me. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. May God add a blessing to the readers, the hearers, and the doers of his holy word. Thank you, brother. You can be seated. Good morning. Let me welcome you again to First Baptist Church. I tell you every week, this is the best place in the whole world to be, and I always mean it. It's always true, but I feel the weight of it a little bit more this morning. You might know that uh, this is uh, the weekend of the Jacksonville Pastors Conference, and we were able to welcome hundreds of pastors from all over the country here to... to be with us and learn about ministry, great men. We had uh, hundreds of women from all over the country here for our women's conference. And that took hundreds of you volunteering to serve these people. And I just wanna say, uh, whether you are a staff person uh, who worked a lot of extra hours or a volunteer who worked a lot of extra hours, uh, we are really, really grateful for you. Uh, a lot of those volunteers are standing right behind me in our choir and orchestra, and everybody said great things about you like they always do. Uh, it was great. And I know we have some pastors hanging around here, so I'm not getting ready to say anything bad about anybody. But yesterday, I was sitting right over here, hours of listening to some of the best preachers in the country, making me feel real great about myself. And I'm sitting over here and I was feeling funny. And I, then I started to realize I feel a little bit frustrated. And I'm like, what am I frustrated about? And I realized I was sick of sitting in this room without you in it. And so I'm just really glad that we're all back where we need to be here on Sunday morning at First Baptist Church. This is a really special time in our service of worship. We're not hitting the pause button on worship. We are continuing our worship. It is a time for us to make an investment in the kingdom with our finances. It's a time to worship with our wallet where we could communicate in our heart and in our lives that our life is not about the accrual of resources. It is about an investment in the kingdom. We always do this every week. Last week was a little bit unique. We took up two offerings last week. I asked you to make an offering uh, to contribute to the needs of our church, and our church also took up a separate offering to contribute to the needs of First Coast Women's Services because we want to partner with that ministry to eradicate abortion in Northeast Florida in our lifetimes. And I want to let you know that you were very generous last week. You contributed so that we could turn the lights on and run our church and do our ministry. And you also gave $50,000 to First Coast Women's Service. And I told First Coast Women's Services, that's a good start. We're going to do better than that next year. So we'll be praying about that for next year. But I want to let you know how much I appreciate. We double dipped on you last week. Uh, and you were incredibly generous. And I'm very grateful. And we're going to have an opportunity to worship like that again even now. If you're here this morning and a visitor with us, we want to welcome you. We're not asking you for anything. That card that Pastor Sean told you about at the very beginning, when the plate is passed, if you want to drop that in there, that'll just give us an opportunity to pray for you you and know how to serve you. As we prepare to worship in this way, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for the men and women and the boys and the girls of First Baptist Church. So thankful for the generous hearts that you've given them. And we know it comes from you. We know the generosity we have comes from your generosity as you gave your son Jesus to give up all of his riches and become poor so that we could have life forever. I pray, Father, that as we continue to worship that you would help us, that you'd help us to give, that you'd help us to focus our hearts on you. We thank you for these 
students who are standing up here this week. We thank you for their voices that help lead us in worship. And Father, we want to ask that we would love Jesus more because of the next few minutes together. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
church. Let's sing it together. Everybody's all right. A little uh, stumble there, but uh, everybody's okay. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. We're coming back to this. I skipped over it last week because I wanted to talk about the next passage at uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday, but we're back here today. Matthew 7, 1 to 6, uh, since you were in here last week, there have been many better preachers than I stand behind this pulpit, but there have been nobody better than you sitting in front of it. So, uh, uh, so Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, we are studying the book of Matthew because it was written by a man named Matthew whose life was changed by Jesus. And he wrote down what happened because he wanted you to experience the change of life that he experienced. And so we're taking the opportunity as a church to know Jesus more and see him and listen to him and learn from him. And today we come to these verses and this is what God says. Do not judge so that you'll not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before a swan, or they will trample you under them, under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. Let's pray. Father, we want to ask that you would watch over us. I want to ask that you would take care of your people. And you have decided that what we all need at this moment is to be together from wherever we are and to think about and to encounter and to be changed by these words of Jesus. I want to ask that you would overcome my weaknesses as a preacher and overcome all of our weaknesses as listeners and shape us into the image of Jesus. I pray that you change our hearts. I pray that you would change our city. And Father, I pray that you would even begin to do it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, with these verses this week, I want to let you know that I am coming in front of you with a really heavy heart. 
Because these verses in Matthew that Jesus just spoke are, are verses and words about conflict. They are instructions about the separation that exists in human relationship because of sin. Conflict might, might be the most obvious and significant demonstration that we live in a world that's fundamentally broken. It might be the case that the most obvious display of sinfulness in a broken world is the broken relationships that you live with and encounter every day. I know that as I look across this room and see each of you, I know I am looking at people who are dealing with conflict in your relationship. There is separation and brokenness in your lives. It either has happened in the past, it's going on now, or it is coming. Maybe it is a broken relationship with your brother or sister that you live with. Maybe with a friend. Maybe with a coworker at the office. Maybe with a spouse. Maybe you could look around this room and be aware of broken relationships with another brother or sister in Christ, even as you sit right here. The attitudes and the actions that flow out of our hearts and create human conflict is some of the most bitter poison imaginable. That poison takes relationships that are supposed to be sweet and full of joy, and it makes them coarse and bitter. That poison hits you and brings about pain and hurt in your life because in conflict, somebody that you love and care about said something to you or did something to you and it hurts, it stings, and you hate it. That poison of conflict creates regret in you. Because people don't just hurt us in conflict, we hurt others. And in the conflict, there's the back and forth missile strike of the harsh words. And most of us have been there where in the throes of a conflict, we are aware that words are tumbling out of our mouth and they are bringing intense pain and we wish with everything in our lives that we could bring them back and we can't. And we remember what we said and we remember what we did or we remember what we didn't say or what we didn't do and it causes us extreme regret. The poison of conflict makes us forget. Some of you are in conflicts now or have been in conflicts in the past and you're looking at what's being said on Facebook or you're looking at the text messages or you're feeling the ice and chill in the environment and you don't even remember how this stupid thing got started. You don't even remember what began the thing. You just know it's broken and you're sick of it. There isn't anybody in this room that doesn't have some point of contact with those consequences of that poison. And I'm broken by it this morning. And I am here in front of you to bring you good news. Jesus, in these words, addresses that most common sinful problem, and he gives us an actual strategy to help. I want to look for the next few minutes at four very practical steps that Jesus Christ gives to you to help you resolve the conflict that is creating pain and sorrow and anger and frustration and regret in your lives. Four practical steps from Jesus to begin to fix the problem. And here's the first one. You need to embrace a generous view of other people. You need to embrace a generous view of other people. If you are in conflict 
or as you get ready for the conflict that is coming, Jesus Christ wants you to embrace a generous view of other people. One of the problems is how you are thinking about the person with whom you're in conflict, and Jesus wants you to be more generous. He tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge so that you will not be judged. Every unbeliever in the universe knows this verse is in the Bible. And they are happy. It's, it's the, maybe the one verse in the Bible they have memorized, and they are happy to perform their scripture memory on you if you tell them they are doing something they're not supposed to be doing. Don't judge me. Everybody knows this verse is in the Bible. But we got to be careful with it. Because the Jesus who here forbids judging at other places in the Bible commands judging. And no unbeliever has that verse memorized. But it's in John chapter 7, verse 24. And Jesus says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Jesus in one place says to judge, and in another place he says don't judge. There is a way that you can judge that is wrong, and there is a way that you can judge that is right. In John chapter 7, Jesus says the right way to judge is with righteous judgment and not by appearance. In Matthew chapter 7, the kind of judgment Jesus excludes is a harsh, uncritical kind of judgment. A judgment that believes the absolute worst about people instead of the best. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 14, verse 10. He asks, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God. The kind of judgment that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 14 is the same kind of judgment that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 7, and it's the kind of judgment that is a judgment of contempt. I look at you and I just don't like you. I look at you and I just think bad things about you. It's not making a biblical judgment that your behavior is wrong that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, we're going to get there in just a few minutes, he identifies some people as dogs and hogs, and he wants you to be able to judge them that way too. So the kind of judgment that he forbids here is this harsh, critical judgment that thinks the worst about people. We persist in conflict. You have ongoing conflict in your life right now because you're not being a generous person. You're thinking the worst about people instead of the best. And to help you be generous, you need to consider all the things you don't know. There's so much we don't know about people. Even the people we don't like. In fact, maybe especially the people we don't like. The person you're in a conflict with you don't know what has gone on in their life, what difficulty has caused them trouble, and they're carrying around a ton of problems. And you don't know what impact that has had on their interaction with you. You don't know the intent of their heart. Maybe they said something to you that they intended to be helpful, that they intended to be encouraging, and it just came out wrong. And you judged that they were trying to hurt you and they were really trying to help, but they fumbled the ball a little bit. And you just don't know. You don't know the other side of the story. More often than we could possibly admit, we make a judgment about somebody based on something we heard or something we think we saw or some wonderful report on social media. And we just don't know the other side of the story and we're not even trying to figure out what it is. And we walk around angry and upset when what we need to be is generous and be humble 
and admit there's stuff we just don't know. And we need to be careful if we're going to live that way. Because if you're going to live that way, here's what you're doing. You're raising the law. You're raising the legal standard for how we make determinations. You are having a stricter standard than God. And if you judge people by a stricter standard than God does, then God is going to judge you by the same standard. That's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. In the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. We need to be very, very careful before we go judging people, not knowing their motives, not knowing the rest of the story, not knowing the larger context, because God's going to treat us that way if we treat other people that way, and nobody wants that. We need to conquer conflict here. And we can conquer conflict here. Jesus says, be generous. Quit being so judgy all the time. Some of the reason you have been and you are and you will be in conflict is because, guys, listen, we just need to cut people some slack. You know? It's, this is a hard world we're living in. And we need to cut each other some slack and extend a generous view of other people instead of a harsh critical, condemning view. Here's a second practical step to resolve conflict. First, embrace a generous view of other people. Second, be the first to admit fault. Be the first to admit fault. Jesus criticizes a common approach to conflict resolution in these words with an incredible mental picture. The most common approach to conflict resolution is who started it. And the conflict is about me trying to prove that the thing I did was because of something else you did. I can't believe you said that to me. Well, I said that to you because you did that thing to me. Well, let me tell you why I did that thing to you. I did that thing to you because of what you said to me. Well, I said that to you because you always act like your mother. <laughs> and it's over. What I'm trying to do is to make you responsible for the conflict. And if you would understand that you did the thing that made me do my thing, then this would all go away. But I don't understand that. I want to help you understand that you did the thing that made me do my thing. And you can't ever get back to the beginning of that stream. It doesn't exist. Jesus identifies this by talking about the log and the speck. Verse 3. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your eye? Jesus is not talking about here the relative size of sins. He's not saying, deal with the really big sins... And then later on, you can deal with the really small sins. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, it makes as much sense for you with a load-bearing beam hanging off of your face to stumble up to somebody and try to reach and see a little tiny speck of dust in their eye. It makes as much sense to do that as it does to try to talk about somebody else's sins before you've talked about yours. Jesus is saying, if you want to deal with conflict, quit passing the buck. Quit finding fault. And have humble grace to admit your own sin. And then say it and talk about it. Own it. Our conflicts persist. 
Because we walk around thinking the absolute worst of everybody else and the absolute best of ourselves. And we wonder why we're at odds. And Jesus says, stop the search and destroy mission. Husband and wife, stop it. Brother and sister, stop it. Church members, stop it. What you need to do is quit the search and destroy mission on everybody else and search your own heart and find some sin to confess in there. It's there. And confess that. Embrace a generous view of other people. Be the first to admit fault. Number three, help others see their sins. Help others see their sins. One of the most amazing things about this teaching of Jesus is his honesty about our role when we see sin. Just because you have a log in your eye doesn't mean that after you get it out, Jesus doesn't want to help you get the speck out of somebody else's. Jesus Christ wants to use you, you, to identify sin in the life of somebody else. Jesus wants to use you, you with the log in your eye, you, after you get it out, after you are thinking the best of people, after you really understand the issue, Jesus wants to use you to help identify sin in the life of other people. Jesus wants you to point out sin to people you love. And this makes us uncomfortable. It makes us uncomfortable if we're likable people. If you're thrilled about this part, you might not have very many friends. Ooh, good. <laughs> I've been waiting for a biblical reason to get after somebody. Yeah, you probably don't, not many people probably like you. Probably don't have very many followers on Twitter. Or maybe you have a whole big bunch of followers on Twitter, actually. I don't know how that works. But for people who want to be loving, it sounds harsh to hear that you're supposed to talk about sin. What we want to say is, I don't want to do that. That's not in my business. I'm going to leave that to God. Okay, fine. Let's leave it to God and let's see what God says. We'll leave it to God. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Jesus, the Son of God, says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If you want to leave this to God... Leave it to God and hear Jesus, the Son of God, in Luke chapter 17, verse 3, say, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If you want to leave it to God, leave it to God and hear Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. You want to be spiritual? You got to listen to God on this. You got to talk to your brother or your sister, your friend, your neighbor about the sin that you see. Jesus says in our passage this morning, Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. You got to do that. But why do you take the log out of your eye? Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Our conflicts persist because both sides need to take responsibility. When you've taken responsibility for your part in the conflict, you've only done half the work. The other person still needs help too, and Jesus wants you to be used of him to identify that trouble. In some relationships, like marriage, you might be the only person who sees the sin. You might be the only person who sees the speck. And your spouse needs you to identify areas where they yet need to be more like Jesus. If we want to conquer conflict, if we want to really deal with this, we're going to have to love each other enough to courageously and graciously point out the sin in the lives of people who are around us. We need to embrace a generous view of other people 
We need to be the first to admit fault. We need to help others see their sins. Lastly, if we're going to resolve conflict, we're going to have to learn to deal with disappointment. We're going to have to learn to deal with disappointment. Jesus gives us a powerful word picture of pearls and dogs and hogs. And we need to know what they mean. He says in verse 6, Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What are the pearls and what are the dogs and the hogs? Well, the pearls are people who value the words of Jesus here. The pearls are the people who want to think the best of others. They are the people who want to take responsibility for their own sin. The pearls are the people who want to help you see your sin because they love you and they want you to be more like Jesus. And the dogs and the hogs are the people who do not want that. Dogs are wild dogs of ancient Israel. Pigs are the unclean animals from the Old Testament. They are vicious and wild. You're to have nothing to do. All they do is destroy things. Jesus identifies the people who won't listen to him on this as dogs and hogs. They are the people who think the worst. They are the people who won't admit their own sin. They don't even see it. They're the people who won't listen to you talk about what they don't have right. They're the people who no matter what won't meet and talk and come to a conclusion. One of the things I've learned in my life, one of the things I've learned in ministry is that the people who won't meet and talk and be humble are the problem. And that's the point. Jesus is actually giving us hope in this. For those of you who are in a conflict and you're trying and you're praying, you're asking Jesus for grace and you're trying to think good things of other people and you're trying to own responsibility for the things you've gotten wrong and you would like without any anger or frustration or bitterness to point out where somebody needs to grow and that person in your life just won't do it and it breaks your heart. Jesus is telling you, this isn't your responsibility anymore. It's just not. It's not your responsibility anymore. When you have done everything that depends on you to live at peace with all men, you've done what you can do. And there are some people who like the fight. There are some people who want the conflict. There are some people who need to say the stuff on social media. There are some people who need to send the hateful text. There are some people who are compelled to give you the sideways glance in the hallway and gossip about you. For whatever reason, there are some people who are that way. And when it breaks your heart and you want to fix it and you can't, Jesus Christ is telling you to look at those people and think, It's not you. It's them. They are dogs and hogs. And you are off the hook. But you're off the hook at verse 6, not off the hook at verse 1. He doesn't say, hey, let me tell you what, there's dogs and hogs, don't worry about them. Then think the best of people. Then take responsibility for your sin. Then try to help them see that. No. Verse 6 comes at the end of verses 1 to 5. After you've tried, after you've prayed, after you've been humble, when people persist, that's when we make the judgment that they're dogs and hogs, but not at the beginning. 
And here's the thing. If you're a dog and a hog, Jesus is unhappy with you. And he wants you to change. And he would ask you through these words that he spoke so many years ago to quit being a dog and a hog. And that's where we get to the really good news. Because the really good news is not only what is said in these verses. The really good news is who is saying them. This is Jesus. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God. And that's important because you and I are sinners. We do not obey God. We don't even care. And the Bible describes our relationship with God as one of total conflict. We are at war and his enemies. And Jesus Christ comes to take care of that. In Romans chapter 5 verse 10, while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The worst conflict in your life is not the conflict between you and any other human being. The worst conflict in your life is the conflict between you and God. You have made yourself through your sin and disobedience a sworn enemy of God. And he loves you so much that he sends his son to die. He sends his son to live a perfect life. He sends his son to bleed on the cross where every drop pays for your sin. He rises from the grave. And when you believe in him, when you trust in him, the conflict is over. Jesus Christ has defeated and won the worst conflict imaginable. He can take care of the other conflicts in your life. So you need to trust him. If you're here this morning, and this seems impossible to you. If you're here this morning and you find it impossible to think the worst or the best. You find it impossible to think the best of somebody in your life. Ask Jesus and he'll help you. If you're here this morning and you find it impossible to admit your own sin to somebody, ask Jesus and he'll help you. If you're here this morning and you find it impossible to think about saying to somebody, maybe a boss, Maybe an older, wiser friend, maybe a spouse, maybe a parent. You find it impossible to talk to that kind of person about their sin. Ask Jesus and he will help you. If you're here this morning and you're a dog and a hog. And you have fought this every step of the way in some relationship, maybe for years. You don't have to stay that way. Ask Jesus and he will help you. And the reason you know. Jesus can help you in that conflict. It's because he already has helped you in your conflict with God. And he's brought peace to you. And so let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of Jesus who has reconciled us to you. Father, I want to ask for your grace that if there's anyone in here who has never repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus and so are still at war with you this morning, that they would come to Jesus, that they would trust in him and be at peace. And Father, I want to ask for people in this room who are struggling with conflict, that you give your grace to be generous, to be humble, to be bold, and to trust you when conflict persists. 
Father, I want to ask that you would bring peace in our relationships. I want to ask that you would bring peace wherever it is not in our church. And Father, I'm asking that you would bring peace to anyone this morning who is at war with you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord. 
Gave me life, but it's free.